In the last lecture, uh, we saw how John Trumbull constructed an image of a heroic American loss at the beginning of the Revolutionary War. It shows pain and death, but his audience knew that the battle was only a setback on the way to triumph. Trumbull put the spotlight on the qualities of bravery and willingness to sacrifice that were going to bring victory in the end. This painting is different. It doesn't show a battle with a famous name like Bunker Hill or Austerlitz. It doesn't even show a battle at all. But it does show a scene from recent history, a historic defeat. Let's simply look at the image on the screen for a minute or so, and then I'll start talking again. There are clumps of people in the foreground <coughs> where the light falls on them and on the snow. Behind them is an undulating mass. Uh, lower at the left, all of the people heading in that direction towards the left side. Behind them, uh, and a little to one side, uh, there's a man on horseback wearing a big hat. We can hardly see his face in the shadows. Everybody in the picture looks to be in poor shape, or worse. A young man in a helpless pose is supported by a woman, the only woman anywhere in sight. They both lean back against a horse that's died. Next to them, a dead soldier lies with his face in the snow. We can see from his sword that he was an officer. Behind him uh, is a man who's not in uniform, sitting, clasping his hands with an expression of wild-eyed distraction in his face. Farther back at the far right is a fire. And beyond that, a cluster of men who were bent over at some kind of work. It looks up close as though they're butchering meat, which would have to be horse meat. Closer to us, uh, two men are warming themselves uh, at the fire. A soldier leans toward them and points to the mass of marching men. There's been a halt, but it's over now, and now it's time to get going again. Beyond them is a mass of brown figures and the barrels of very many rifles. We notice that the scene is framed at the bottom by the dead man uh, on the left and two others on the ground at the right, one of whom reaches up towards the man on horseback at the middle at the apex of the composition. Neither of these men looks as though he's going to be able to get up. In the middle is a man in uniform, in a fur coat or a fur collar, with epaulets and a medal, obviously an officer. His leg is bandaged as he steps forward with the help of a soldier. He can't even hold his head up. Taking a closer look at the mounted man, uh, we see that he holds his hand on his hip in a traditional pose of command. Behind him is the top of an army standard, a flagstaff with an eagle finial. And just above it, in the haze, a faint star. The mounted man is one of the few who's not looking exhausted, but of course he's been riding, not walking. Just in front of him, another horseman can be seen slumping forward in his saddle. The label tells you that this painting is by Ari Scheffer, and that the title is The Retreat of Napoleon's Army from Russia in 1812. 
So here I need to remind you of some facts about that retreat, facts that people in 1826, when the picture was shown, knew very well. I think, though, that they would have only recognized one person in the picture, the horseman in the big hat, who is not Napoleon, as we might think, but the commander of the rear guard of the retreat, Marshal Joseph Ney. They didn't need a label to tell them what this army was, or where it was, or why it was in such desperate condition. The French Empire looked like this in 1810. All the areas shown in color were part of France, or controlled by France. By spring 1812, Napoleon was masses his, massing his forces in East Prussia and Poland, at least 600,000 men which includes fighting units that he'd conscripted from the Prussians and the Austrians. This was the biggest army ever seen. His target was the army of his former ally, Tsar Alexander I. Russia was the only remaining power on the continent, and if he could defeat Russia, France could control every nation except Great Britain, and perhaps eventually that too. The map reminds you of the vast distances involved here. Uh, Moscow and Petersburg, Moscow and Petersburg, uh, you can see them up there in the upper right, are more than 1,500 miles northeast of Paris. On June 24th, the main army began to cross over from Poland into Lithuania and to march east. The army was so big that it took them six days to pass a single point. Napoleon was using blitzkrieg tactics to move fast, throw everything against them, crush their army quickly, take their capital, ruin their morale, and set terms for peace. That had worked in smaller countries. But here there were surprises along the way. In this barren northern countryside, it was nowhere near as easy to get food and fodder to live off the land as it had been in the more fertile Central Europe. And there was no Russian army to crush. The Russian strategy was to retreat continuously, never stopping to engage the inv invaders, drawing the French farther and farther into the inhospitable interior. This went on for weeks and weeks as the hot summer wore on and on. Men and horses got steadily weaker moving supplies and replacements all the way from the Polish border got harder every day. The roads were bad, there was dust, there were harassing attacks by bands of Cossacks who burned farms and villages and fields, classic scorched earth tactics. Tens of thousands of men deserted and many more died from starvation and from disease. Napoleon's grand army shrank by two thirds on the way to Moscow, before there was a real battle. When it came in se September at Borodino, 50 miles from Moscow, the result was a tremendously bloody uh, uh, engagement, uh, which nobody won. There were huge losses on both sides. There's a wonderful description of Borodino in War and Peace that some of you will remember. Uh, during the fighting, Marshal Ney was so inspiring that Napoleon gave him the title of Prince of Moscow. It was going to take a few years for the irony of that to become apparent. The Tsar stuck with his strategy. He ordered Moscow stripped of its supplies, its buildings burned, its population evacuated, allowing Napoleon to take the city without opposition. Napoleon had thought for the Russians to lose their historic capital would certainly humiliate them into peace negotiations, but Alexander declined, knowing that pretty soon he wouldn't need to negotiate. Napoleon waited in Moscow for six weeks, and then in October, with the weather getting worse, he withdrew from the city and tried to find and defeat the main Russian army under General Kutuzov. He couldn't find the enemy. As the weather got wetter and colder, the great retreat began, all the way back across Russia to Poland by foot, something like 700 miles. I think that's the distance from New Haven to the border of South Carolina, 
or maybe more to the point, to Nova Scotia. For two months, the weather was bad, and then it got much worse, going down to 10 and 20 below zero, below Fahrenheit, uh, below zero Fahrenheit, and then for weeks at 30 below. The Russian army didn't have much work to do. The hypothermia and disease and exhaustion and desertion on the French army did the work for them. The most astonishing image of the Russian campaign I know uh, is this chart by a French engineer demonstrating the size of the French army going in and coming out from Russia. The tan band uh, here shows them advancing and the black retreating with the width of the band in proportion to the number of men. You see uh, 450,000 entering, that's just the French, by the way, never mind that there were 150,000 foreigners in the army. And after Borodino, 100,000 men make it to Moscow. And before leaving Russia, there were 10,000. It's this last stage that we see in Schaeffer's painting. This was an epic loss of life, the worst ever. Napoleon went in assuming that conquering Russia meant defeating the army, or at least occupying the capital. Tsar Alexander knew that the French army could conquer itself by overreaching, and it did. A few weeks into the long retreat, Napoleon learned that there had been an unsuccessful coup d'etat in France, and he set off on a retreat of his own, uh, not um, on um, horseback, as you see in this rather sympathetic painting on the right, not on horseback, but by sleigh, leaving the all-important rear guard of the army in charge of his most trusted general, Marshal Ney, whom he later called the bravest of the brave. Ney's courage and his empathy with the troops were already legendary. Russian Cavalry and bands of Cossack militia attacked Nye's rear guard over and over again. At one point they were encircled, but they fought their way out again. Most of their horses died and were promptly eaten. Artillery had to be abandoned, supplies had to be carried by hand, and officers had to walk. The last obstacle for the survivors was the Berezina, a wide river on the border that would normally have been frozen solid in November so that they could have walked across, but not this year. This year there was a freakish thaw. The river couldn't be crossed, and they were trapped. But Ney had his field engineers build two trestle bridges so that practically everybody was able to make it to safety. The departure of the Grande Armée after months of suffering uh, soon belonged to the legends of both countries. For the French, it showed them their own indomitable spirit. For the Russians, their own historic God-given power to expel foreigners. A century later, this very legend helped sustain the Russians when Nazi Germany tried the same thing. The French army never fully recovered. French, France lost its allies, Russia, uh, Austria, and Prussia, and soon had them as enemies. In the two years that followed, Nye went on to command other forces for Napoleon and won battles here and there. Like many Frenchmen who'd been swept up 20 years earlier by Napoleon's decisiveness and his tactical brilliance, Nye was increasingly disillusioned. In April 1814, when it became obvious that France was going to lose to the combined European nations, it was Nye, the fearless Nye, who went to the emperor to tell him that he should abdicate. And he did abdicate. And the Bourbon monarchy was restored. King Louis XVIII was crowned, and Napoleon was exiled to the island of Elba off the Italian coast. But Within a year, Napoleon was back in France, leading an army of local militias and soon joined by army veterans, what you see on the right. After the restoration, Marechal Ney 
had felt that his duty was to the nation and he'd sworn loyalty to the king, weak and unpopular as the new royal government was. He saw Napoleon's return to France as the act of a madman and an outlaw, and he told the king that he'd bring Napoleon back to Paris in an iron cage. But soon after that, he changed his mind, deciding that Napoleon was gaining such support that he could again be the savior of France. So Nye defected to his old commander, Napoleon, taking his troops with him. Napoleon's restoration to power for the famous Hundred Days, as everybody knows, ended uh, in Belgium at Waterloo, where the Prussians under Blüchner and the Dutch and the British under Wellington, at the right here, caused such losses to the French that there was really no recovering. Nye uh, fought bravely as usual. Napoleon's punishment was exile again this time to the tiny island of St. Helena, 1,400 miles from France, and this time exile was permanent. In the meantime, Nye was seized by the re-restored Bourbon government, clapped in prison, and put on trial for high treason. This prosecution, by the way, violated the peace treaty, but Nye got next to no support from Wellington, and the trial proved to be sensational. There was really never any doubt that he had defected, and he was too honest for his own good in the trial. The royalists on their side saw Nye as exactly the traitor that they could make an example of. His death sentence was not so much punishment for Nye or even revenge as it was a warning to Bonaparte loyalists and anti-monarchists who might make trouble. Nye was convicted, and the next morning he was hustled before a firing squad. He was in the act of protesting his sentence when he was gunned down. A contemporary illustration shows the scene just outside the Luxembourg Palace on the lower left. Nye became a symbol of the vindictiveness of the king and his ministers. For liberals, for many people who believed in constitutional monarchy, Nye was a martyr. When a more liberal monarchy succeeded in 1830, and later when Napoleon III revived the empire, under a constitution, Nye became a public hero again. The painter Jérôme, as you will hear next week, was a liberal sympathizer of the Bonapartist cause, as Ari Scheffer was, and he made an astonishing painting uh, of the dead hero with his face down on the pavement as his killers on the left marched off. In 1848, the government made reparations for the shame of his trial and execution, which it declared were irregular. And in 1853, after the Second Empire had begun, a statue of Nye was erected near the spot where he was executed. Schaeffer's painting of 1826 looks back across a dozen years and recalls the low point of the glorious French army in a humiliating defeat led by a man, Marshal Nye, who did his duty, but was doomed. This is a new kind of image of war, pervaded by gloom that foretold even worse things to come. There's no glory anywhere in sight. The picture acknowledges Nye's leadership in the darkest hour, and it signals Schaeffer's political sympathies and those of his circle of friends. We'll come back to the painting. But first, who exactly was Ari Scheffer, you may be thinking. Uh, for the moment, I'll call him Ari Scheffer because he was Dutch. He was born in 1795 in Dordrecht, the Dutch river city that you see in the wonderful painting in, by Turner across the street in the British Arts Center. Scheffer became the most famous native of Dordrecht, but his fame peaked in the 19th century, and today not so many people know about him who aren't actually from Dordrecht themselves. One of the main public squares in Dordrecht is the Schaeffersplein, where you can have coffee next to his statue. And there are other reminders, too, all over the city. <laughs> in, um, in 1795, uh, the year Schaeffer was born, the Netherlands became the Batavian Republic, having converted to liberty, equality, and fraternity, and having become a client state uh, of revolutionary France. 
Scheffer was trained in Amsterdam and moved to Paris with his mother at the age of 16. He came from a family of artists and political liberals, so it's no surprise that he'd go to France and try his hand uh, in the big time. He worked in the busy studio of Pierre Guérin, who continued the tradition of Jacques-Louis David here on the right, the leading practitioner of large-scale history painting, uh, who got many commissions from the government. Guérin was terrifically successful, having turned from the severe uh, public dramas drawn, like David's, uh, drawn from Roman history, uh, and instead painted stories like the one on the left that he dreamed up himself, like an imaginary man called Marcus Sextus, who returns home after a long exile to find his wife dead. This was a domestic tragedy meant to touch the hearts of the nobles who'd emigrated during the revolution and who were now returning to France under the new monarchy. Guérin also painted erotic mythologies uh, in a more ingratiating and slick style that had particular appeal for the Empress Josephine and the Napoleon's court. Scheffer wasted no time uh, in his career building. In 1812, uh, the year that the Grande Armée set off for Moscow, uh, Scheffer began to exhibit at the annual salons, trying out various subjects and styles, using familiar neoclassical formulas and applying them to medieval and modern French history. There were heroic stories to be told uh, from the French Middle Ages. There were the six brave citizens of Calais, here on the left, sacrificing themselves as hostages during the English siege of 1342. This is a very large painting of the Burgers of Calais, better known from the sculptural group of Rodin of 1889. I have to show you a terrible slide because the picture is uh, in the Palais Bourbon, the French lower house, but surely was intended as uh, an explicit lesson addressed to people in authority. Schaeffer, got a medal uh, at the Salon of 1817 uh, for the picture on the right, the death of Louis uh, IX, uh, who was an ancestor of the recently restored Bourbon King Louis XVIII. Louis IX was not just saintly, he was actually a saint. He was canonized in 1297. So the painting has a clear political intention to remind its audience of the sanctity of the royal line uh, from which their new Catholic ruler was descended. Schaeffer's skill at painting medieval virtue, and probably his social skills too, got him the job of teaching drawing uh, to the children of Louis Philippe, the Duke of Orleans, who would soon be coming to power in the decade or so and improving Schaeffer's fortunes even more. Uh, here is uh, Schaeffer's uh, self-portrait in 1830, full of confidence and his portrait of his best-known pupil, Marie, the Princess of Orléans, uh, at the right, who became a very accomplished sculptor before she died young. The portrait has this sort of boneless, uh, svelte physique that had been made popular by Ingres, uh, but also a genuine ascetic purity that became part of the Schaeffer stock in trade. Uh, Schaeffer is mostly known today for history paintings uh, taken from literature and depicting scenes of anguished love and despair. The most famous uh, is this one on the left in the Inferno of Dante. Uh, Paolo Malatesta and Francesca de Rimini were lovers who took literature to heart. Uh, reading the story of Launcelot and Guinevere led them into adultery and her husband murdered them both. Dante finds their ghosts in the second circle of hell, floating through the air, forever pursuing each other in utter futility. This was an enormously popular picture. Goethe's Faust provided Schaeffer with many of his best-known subjects, like the scene of Walpurgisnacht, where Mephistopheles uh, here makes the guilty Faust watch the apparition of his illicit lover, Gretchen, wandering distraught carrying their drowned baby. Well, I managed to get this far without once mentioning the words romantic or romanticism, but you already recognize the pattern in Schaeffer's choices of subject matter. He shares the early 19th century taste for scenes of the uncanny, uh, 
of the irrational, of tormented love, and of the doomed, all part of a great shift of interest in literature and art and music, away from the rational, sort of impersonal confidence uh, of the Enlightenment uh, towards, you could say, the dark side, where inexplicable and terrible things happen, often from no fault of the victims. Schaeffer's scene of the retreat uh, in Russia is a product of this great shift. The painting is an admission of abject defeat. It's not in any way a celebration of victory like most Napoleonic scenes of war. Uh, and Trumbull's Battle of Bunker Hill also illustrates a defeat, as I mentioned, and the prominent death of a young soldier. But unlike Trumbull's picture, Schaeffer's scene doesn't show a famous moment or a setback on the way to glory. It's the beginning of the end of the empire, and for Nye, and everybody who looked at it knew that. Schaeffer's meditation on this side of war was encouraged by his friendship from, with his uh, friend from the Guérin studio, the slightly older Theodore Géricault. Like Schaeffer, uh, like uh, Géricault showed his first painting at the Salon of 1812, uh, this life-size picture of a swashbuckling uh, cal cavalry officer uh, charging forward, twisting to look back. He makes about as dynamic an image of glory in war as you could get. It's not a commissioned portrait. It was evidently painted on spec. The real turn in the road came two years later after the defeat in Russia and Napoleon's ab uh, abdication in 1814. That's when Jericho showed a second full-length painting at the Salon, right next to the earlier one. And this was a very new kind of image. The officer is wounded, dismounted, moving down a slope away from the battle, out of action. It's about defeat, about isolation, literally decline. And it's painted with broad, heavy, opaque strokes that are nothing like the dashing brushwork of the horsemen of a couple of years earlier. Five years later, again, without being commissioned to do so, Jericho uh, exhibited the most uh, horrific scene ever presented at the Salon, the raft of the Medusa, which is 24 feet wide. I'm, I'm showing you first an image by the contemporary German photographer Thomas Struth, just to demonstrate the scale. presents an event of three years earlier when crew members of a French Navy frigate called Medusa were abandoned on an improvised raft after the ship went aground. After two weeks of starvation, dehydration, cannibalism even, 15 survived out of the 147 people on the raft. The story was known to everybody and it caused a political scandal the shipwreck was blamed on the incompetence of the captain, who was a member of the nobility. The painting was taken as an accusation of the Bourbon government. But in just five years, it was bought for the state. Jerigo put great effort into imagining the scene and studying the poses and expression. He gave it a kind of Michelangelo-like grandeur, but also a minute accuracy going to the extreme of getting medical students to let him paint body parts that had been dissected. Jericho's curiosity about real life extremes and the irrational side of human life led him to paint portraits of patients of the pioneer psychologist Dr. Georget, people who suffered from different delusions. This is a woman who was a compulsive gambler. Jericho was not the first artist of the Romantic era to see madness as more interesting than sanity. Francisco Goya had done that a generation earlier. He treated, uh, treated an insane asylum as though asking us to consider whether the delusions of these people are any different from those at the Spanish royal court, or for that matter, whether these men wrestling are any more demented than soldiers killing one another. What made the raft of Medusa so powerful, and still does, is that it's an image of 
terrible possibilities in human life that will be abandoned, that will be left to die, forgotten. That maybe civilization is just a thin curtain that barely hides the truth of irresponsible government and brutal indifference among people. For Jericho, shipwreck was a metaphor of the truth of human life. We see this stripped to the essentials in a little oil sketch upstairs in the galleries where a man in rags holds onto the rocks and another one climbs up behind him. No circumstances shown at all, just the men and the jagged shore and the lines of pounding waves. It's not a story that Jericho pictures, in other words, but a situation, a situation of extreme vulnerability, of being in the grip of forces you can't hope to control. I think Jericho's pictures gave Schaeffer the courage to imagine a scene of retreat uh, from Russia that might have this quality of elemental despair that makes it so remarkable. At the same time Jericho was painting the Raft of the Medusa, he was also treating Napoleon's retreat uh, from Russia. Uh, in this watercolor and print by Jericho, there is no army, no glory, no Marshal Ney, just a few anonymous soldiers doing what they can to help each other. Being so close to Jericho, Schaeffer would have seen these drawings, which I think helped him imagine his vision of the retreat from Russia. In the 1820s, Schaeffer was recognized as one of the leaders of the new generation, along with Jericho, who left the scene by dying in 1824, and his somewhat younger friend, Eugène Delacroix, who made this brilliant debut at the Salon of 1822, with a scene from Dante's Inferno, where Dante and his guide, the poet Virgil, are ferried across a lake in pur purgatory where souls are punished by endless drowning. A huge horror scene like this with anguished nudes obviously depended on the raft of the Medusa, but Delacroix adds lush color and dashing brushwork. Schaeffer followed suit with his own immense painting of high drama at sea. Uh, on the left here, a church commission where the 13th century Dominican uh, saint um, tells a, a whole boatload of frightened passengers to have faith the way Christ had done with his disciples in a storm. A little later, uh, Schaeffer made a rousing reconstruction here, completely imaginary, of the earliest victory won by Clovis in, in the sixth century AD. Clovis, the great Frankish unifier, a Christian convert, Clovis, the embodiment of French solidarity, defeating a confederation, of course, of Germans, the ancient enemy of the French. This picture was also bought by the state, and it became the first in a series uh, of paintings in the Galerie des Batailles uh, in Versailles, created by Louis Philippe. Uh, there it is, I'm sure you can see it, uh, at the far end. Schaeffer was aware of the propaganda value of history painting, um, as aware as government ministers, uh, I hardly have to tell you, and he continued to get royal commissions. Ten years before this, uh, during the time he paints the retreat from Russia, that is, during the reactionary reign of the restored Bourbon king, Charles, v, uh, Charles the, uh, a, the Tenth, uh, Schaeffer kept company with political liberals and entertained subversive ideas. He planned a painting of La Marseillaise uh, on the left, the anthem of the revolution, a song that was banned uh, under the king. Uh, Schaeffer made sketches for it uh, here, but never carried it out. And in 1830, when a new, more liberal regime came in, Schaeffer was trumped forever by Delacroix's famous and brilliant picture, which combines a realistic uh, contemporary people with the indelible allegorical figure of liberty. Schaeffer, in general, is a moderate uh, painter, uh, neither radical, uh, romantic, uh, like Jericho, nor a conservative classicist like Ingres. Instead, he followed what 
in politics was called le juste milieu, the middle way. But there are exceptions, and his retreat from Russia, I think, is a genuinely radical image of war. To see what Napoleonic audiences were accustomed to, though we need to look around, painting Napoleon's exploits was an industry. For 20 years, uh, from his rise to power until Waterloo, a whole platoon of artists made a living painting scenes of war commissioned to glorify the emperor and the regime. He's almost always there as the victor. Many of you have trudged gamely through Versailles, getting more than enough of this kind of painting. The greatest propaganda, of course, had been David on the right here, Napoleon crossing the Alps by David, not on a mule, which he actually did, but in his own words, in his own words, calm on a fiery horse. On the left is the painting uh, by David's former pupil, Baron Gros, uh, that helped to make him a favorite of Napoleon, the young commander here of the French army in Italy at a critical moment when he exposes himself to enemy fire and urges his troops calmly, confidently to cross the bridge of Arcola, which leads to victory over the Austrians. Gros painted two enormous scenes for Napoleon that made an impression on Schaeffer when he arrived in Paris. Both of them set in remote, inhospitable places, and both using the horror of war as a device not to criticize war, but to strengthen the image of the commander-in-chief. This huge painting of Napoleon at Jaffa in Palestine shows him risking his life by visiting French soldiers with bubonic plague, and not just visiting, but by touching one man's sores, alluding both to Christ's miracles and to the belief in the king's touch that cures tubercular scrofula. Napoleon is shown, in other words, as healer, courageous, loving, and quasi-divine. The crowd of suffering victims pushed towards us had a shock value that opened possibilities for both Jericho and Schaeffer. As a history painting, it's as nakedly propagandistic as anything of the entire era. Napoleon had failed in his bloody campaign to move north from Egypt and capture Palestine from the Turks. That's what he was doing in Jaffa. And shortly before this, by the way, he'd ordered the slaughter of thousands of Turkish prisoners. Napoleon's purpose in choosing this subject was clearly to divert attention from the French, of the French from the bad news of an expensive failure to the good news that their commander had godlike powers. That's what we see in the other great painting by Gros, uh, which shows him after the Battle of Elo in East Prussia. This was fought against the Russians and various allies, and it was a hideous bloodbath. Some 30,000 men were lost and nobody won once more, although the Russians withdrew. Gro staged the scene as a kind of pageant of mastery and subjection. We see a lineup uh, of Napoleon here and his marshals surrounding him. Um, as one of the Russian captives kneels to him, and another one here way at the left cries out, and this is a quote uh, from his propagandist minister, cries out, Caesar, if you want me to live, then heal me. I will serve you as faithfully as I did Tsar Alexander. There's another gut-wrenching scene in the foreground. The painter gives the victims almost equal weight with the victors on horseback. They're more graphically painted than ever before, with piled up corpses, men dying, frozen, bloody. And in the case of this Lithuanian soldier with rolling eyes, clearly unhinged. <coughs> that soldier at the top is being held by a French soldier. A reminder to the viewer of the official lesson of the picture, uh, 
that following our emperor's example, we French are merciful. And what's more, all this death will have been worthwhile, for us French anyway. The crazed Lithu Lithuanian you recognize is a relative of Schaeffer's hopeless, wild-eyed man and all the various mentally afflicted people that had so fascinated Jericho. <clears throat> Goya saw the balance of war differently. The series of etchings he called the disasters of war also shows Napoleon's men, this time trying to conquer or terrorize the Spanish during their campaign against Spain and Portugal. Goya doesn't show heroics in war, simply injustice and brutality and death, and he gives his images bitter, ironic captions. <clears throat> These prints were circulating in France uh, later on, but not at the time of the picture by Schaeffer. Nevertheless, I think the spirit of them is very akin to the bleak tone of Schaeffer's scene in Russia. Turner's great battle painting uh, of 1818 of Waterloo doesn't show the, brittle, uh, the British winning the battle, but instead it shows the night after the battle. It's kind of panorama of the dead, the wives and sweethearts searching through them by torchlight. That night, the British shot off flares to discourage looters uh, here, and the Chateau of Hougoumont on the right that Wellington had defended and Napoleon shelled was still burning. All this, gives, all this gives a kind of apocalyptic flavor to the picture, as though this faceless tangle of humans were revealing some ultimate truth uh, about warfare. This is Nap Napole Napoleon's <coughs> final defeat, as expressed by a single soldier. It's a small picture by Horace Vernet, a painter you saw chronicling Napoleon's victors earlier. The French soldier <clears throat> leans on a spade uh, that he's been using to bury the dead. At the right, <clears throat> there's a still life of useless equipment. <clears throat> and in the soil, a cannon and the imperial eagle of an army standard and a bit of the tricolor flag. It's the end, but in the background, there's a suggestion that the golden sun and the cross on the hill promise something new and better for the future. In Schaeffer's picture, there is no golden sun and no bright future, no consolation at all. What we see is a situation rather than an action, the plight of anonymous people in the condition of defeat. This is the subject, not incidentally, coincidentally, of a great and familiar picture painted just two years earlier by Schaeffer's contemporary Delacroix that shows a scene from another war, the Greek War of Independence from the Ottoman Turks that began in 1821. Greece had been part of the Ottoman Empire since the 15th century, and by March 15, 1822, the Greek revolt had spread to the Aegean island of Chios, and it was put down by a huge invasion of Turks who killed about 20,000 Greek civilians and exiled 20,000 more. In Europe, there was very little sympathy for the Turks, but there also wasn't much official recognition of the genocide going on. Europeans learned about the war mainly from the newspapers, and the reaction was something like the reaction to the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s. Writers and intellectuals traveled in small numbers to Greece and volunteered, and others raised money for the victims. This painting and Schaeffer's painting of the retreat from Russia that we have at Yale here was, were both shown in Paris at the benefit exhibition for Greeks held in that year in 1826. Many of the works in that show depicted victimhood in one form or another. Delacroix got a firsthand report from a French officer about the massacres at Chios, but everything else in the picture is his own invention. It's based, of course, on the pictures by Gros and Jericho that we've just seen with their n foreground friezes of victims. It's also enormous like them. But Delacroix paints these people's flesh and costumes much more vividly than anybody had. 
and it's composed differently in a vertical format, suggesting that it may have been sliced off at the sides and implying that what we're seeing is just part of a much wider panorama of suffering that would go on and on. By the way, Sheffer didn't exhibit a Greek scene in the benefit exhibition, but he did paint several of those, like this picture on the left of Greek women holed up in a cave and praying for deliverance. <clears throat> the most um, sensational of these, though, on the right, um, hangs in the Louvre with the Delacroix in the same gallery and shows an incident of some 20 years earlier when the people of Sully on the Adriatic coast had broken away from the Ottoman Empire using weapons supplied by the French and the Russians. <clears throat> When Ali Pasha came with an army to retake their strongholds, many of the Suliyas were killed or taken as slaves. A group of women, rather than being seized and dishonored, as they would have seen it, uh, threw themselves and their infants from the cliffs, which is what Sheffer is showing them preparing to do here. He's adopted the more fluent and broader style of painting from Delacroix, emphasizing the swirling action here and a vehement lighting scheme it actually somewhat resembles the light that he'd used a year earlier in his Russian scene. The picture was bought by the king and helped Sheffer get the Legion of Honor. I want to show you one more picture of war and its victims that Sheffer painted at just this time, the scene of the invasion of French Alsace by the Russians in 1814. Russian troops are burning villages and driving out their civilian populations. <clears throat> Sheffer shows them conflicted over whether to retreat or to return, to fight, and maybe almost certainly be killed. The men wanting to go back, the women holding them back. And they're led by this figure in black, the calm figure of their saintly pastor, Johann Friedrich Oberlin, the famous ed educator for whom the college in Ohio, Oberlin, was named. You can see some obvious similarities in the way that the pictures are composed and lighted and also in the, the themes of both, the consequences of war, brutal victimhood, and resolute leadership by a wise man of honor. Let's just look for a moment at Sheffer's preparations for this picture. <clears throat> These um, started with a sketchy drawing in brown ink. It has the general layout and the strong contrast of light and shade of the finished picture. The main elements are there already. The group uh, at the left uh, at the fire, Marshal Ney in silhouette in the uh, at the top, and the woman supporting a young man. In the last pair you recognize, of course, is a variation of a familiar formula for lamentation or pieta that adds a touch of sanctity to what's happening, <clears throat> the premature loss of a young officer. Sheffer knew very many uh, pietas, including this one by Anibale Karachi in the Louvre, uh, and so did John Trumbull, as you will easily remember, you were, you were here uh, last week, uh, Trumbull, who made subtle allusions to this tradition uh, in the deaths of two young American heroes. I need to point out that the painting has darkened a good deal, and it isn't entirely as legible as it first was. That's the irreversible fate of most paintings in oil on dark ground, which this is. So I want to show you an engraving that reproduces it and reveals uh, quite a lot of detail that's swallowed up in the dark areas of the painting, particularly in the background and particularly uh, in a slide. Uh, in, the, in the gallery, with a good deal of incandescent light, the picture is really quite uh, beautifully revealed and uh, worth your spending time with. The engraving shows more of this mass of soldiers uh, packed together so tightly uh, for one thing, we, we actually we know uh, from a report by one of Nye's generals uh, that he ordered the troops to stay as close together as possible on the march so that they could conserve heat uh, in the freezing cold. That earliest uh, drawing already has the main ingredients, as I said, the big triangle of form, uh, 
with Nye at the top, <clears throat> and the incidents at either side. But the, in the final composition, the men at the fire and the woman with the young soldier have switched sides. And another drawing that we know only from a rather bad reproduction, he's kept the overall shape, but he's moved the point of view back a bit. And most things, however, have stayed in place. And at this point, Schaeffer sketches the whole composition in oil. Uh, he adds color, mainly reds, uh, to pick out the main figures and also the fire. He also changes the proportions a bit to make room for the powerful uh, foreground figure so eloquent in the finished picture. He solved almost all the problems by the time of the sketch, so that <clears throat> the finished picture on the right he really only has to make the foreground uh, clearer at the left by <clears throat> placing some props on the snow to um, mark out the space. Well, let me turn again to the question why Schaeffer, uh, why uh, Schaeffer would have painted this subject. A miserable loss, the French army at its lowest moment, ragged survivors barely escaping a disastrous miscalculation by the emperor. It would help to know whether somebody commissioned the picture, and if so, who? But we don't know that. It disappeared between 1832 and 1986, when a collector in Paris cleaned out his basement. Uh, from whom he or his family got it, we don't, yet, we don't yet know. So for the reasons behind the choice of subject, we need to look at the company Schaeffer was keeping uh, in 1826, and frankly, speculate a bit. I think one reason must have had to do with the shadowy figure of the commander, Marshal Ney, whose story you heard earlier, Ney, who had been, for Napoleon, the bravest of the brave, and who at the time of the painting was a hero, and in some senses a martyr, for the opposition to the restored Bourbon government under Charles X. Schaeffer belonged to that liberal Republican opposition, as you saw in his Marseillaise picture. <clears throat> he was a friend of one of Ney's sons, uh, who bore the title the Duke of Elchingen, who was 22 years old at the time. In his political circle, a progressive uh, political circle, Sheffier would have found a receptive audience, I think, for a scene recalling Nye's role in leading the rear guard to safety and his ingenuity at getting it across the river to safety. One reviewer of the exhibition in 1826, in fact, mistook the title of Schaeffer's picture and called it The Crossing of the Beregina by Marshal Ney. Schaeffer could have painted that subject, but he didn't. Instead, he preferred to construct a scene where nothing remarkable happens, just some misery and suffering and death at the edge of the army's retreat as the steadfast marshal moves the troops onward. I mentioned that the picture made its debut at the exhibition of 1826 to raise money for suffering Greeks, which was organized at a commercial gallery by people of Schaeffer's political persuasion, opponents of the Bourbon regime, a spectrum uh, from all the way from pro-Bonapartists to the backers of the Duc d'Orléans, who four years later was going to lead the next revolution and become a constitutional monarch. The successful rebellion of brave Greeks against the Turks was a model, I think, in the minds of the organizers and for Schaeffer, for Delacroix and others, a model for the escape from monarchical bondage that they wished for France. What outlives the politics of 1826 and can speak to us today, I think, is the image of war that it presents. And that's an image of failure this kind of imagery was a discovery of Schaeffer's generation. We've seen other artists, Goya, Jericho, arousing pity for victims and revulsion at regimes that cause mass, mass suffering. Remember the burial of civilians in mass graves in Goya's engraving, etching, and remember the sailors abandoned on a raft of the French warship Medusa. Schaeffer shows consequences of French hubris in trying to conquer Russia, wholesale suffering and death for people who had no say in military strategy and indeed nothing to gain from it. The victims were French soldiers, 
their allies, Russian soldiers, Russian civilians, hundreds of thousands of victims, young and old, notable officers, nobles, peasant conscripts. In the foreground, he includes people of several social classes, commander and camp follower, the sane and the mad, the well-to-do and the destitute. <clears throat> a few of them rise to acts of compassion, like the woman and the enlisted man, the woman holding the young officer, the enlisted man holding the collapsing standing one on the right, people who care for men who are falling. Sheffer uses visual language clearly and forcefully to put this across. This is the strength, I think, of the picture. And this starts, as we've seen so often with successful history paintings, with the structure, one great solid form made of packed together humans and with small groups and sub-incidents picked out from the mass. The individual gestures are broad and easy to read. The emotional tone is set by the somber color scale, the leaden sky, the masses of brown for the soldiers. In fact, there was criticism for this in 1826. Some thought it was simply too somber, too lacking in variety. I think Schaeffer's strength was to insist on this gloom for expressive purposes. And not just the gloom, but also the brushwork suits the subject. Rough, broken paint surfaces for the ragged costumes and even for the faces. Where the figures are concerned, the gloom is true to life. We actually have a description by a survivor of the retreat, one Captain Francois, who wrote, our bizarre outfits proclaimed our frightful misery and gave us a scary appearance. Our faces were darkened with thick pine smoke and covered with dirt from our bivouacs. We had yellowish skin, eyes hollow and dull, hair greasy and messy, long beards tipped by innumerable little icicles from our running noses. As I said earlier, what Sheffer paints is not an actual historical event, but something else, something distinctly modern, an invented situation, a situation intended for the audience to ponder, one that implies a choice that we humans in general face in our lives at some point between continuing, uh, continuing in a mindless herd movement or defection. Both choices are risky. There's a marvelous picture here in the gallery, painted 30 years later by Gustave Courbet, that operates in something of the same way. Courbet dispenses with the usual apparatus of hunting scenes and shows a man on horse in winter who's been tracking a wounded animal. He stops, unable or unwilling to go farther. We read this in the body language of both the rider and his horse. There's no story. There's just this. The condition of exhaustion in a bleak landscape at the end of whatever futile pursuit brought them there. Schaeffer, I think, certainly wanted us to see his picture as a statement about this terrible failure of a campaign that overreached. It's also a statement about Marshal Ney, his steadfast loyalty to the absent emperor and to his own troops. The knife twists with our knowledge that Ney will have no reward but will be a victim himself while the emperor lives on. I suggest that the artist intended the picture as a kind of meditation on injustice. And beyond that, he may well have wanted us long after to consider the price of aggression, of war, of conquest, and of empire. In Schaeffer's painting, no one succeeds, no one gains anything, everybody loses. His audience and we may be wiser for observing that. The next lecture is 
about a painting in the Yale Center for British Art that shows a mighty king about to meet his downfall, predicted by a great prophet and staged with wonderful extravagance uh, by the English painter John Martin. So please join us then. Thank you. Thank you.